So, it's time to do it. It's time to look at the finger poke of doom in WCW. This video will be a continuation of my Hulk Hogan series here on the channel, but it will also serve as a standalone upload. You won't need to watch the previous video because I'll go over some details again in this upload so you have a full picture of what happened. I'm going to go over today's subject in two parts. We'll first look at everything that happened on TV, and then we'll look at how the finger poke of doom incident affected WCW and try to make sense of why the incident happened. Also, I should point out that the reporting around the finger poke of doom is extremely varied. In researching today's subject, I found numerous contradictions. Books have been written where facts have been twisted to make things seem a little more glamorous, or stories have been told that don't match up with dates or numbers, things like that. I've done my best here in weeding out the nonsense. Anything that hasn't been proven has been left out. So, for example, the day Death of WCW book by Artie Reynolds and Brian Alvarez, all the content within those pages is pretty much second or third hand information. Nobody was in direct contact with Turner Broadcasting when that book was put together so there's no point in using it as a reference. The content of this video, excluding any opinions I may have, will be from employees who were actually in WCW when all of this went down. So let's get to it then, this is the finger poke of Doom in WCW. During mid-1998, the New World Order faction in WCW had split in two. There was the NWO Black and White, led by Hulk Hogan, and there was the NWO Wolfpack, led by Kevin Nash. The NWO storyline had been a major success for WCW after the summer of 1996, but by the time we got to mid-98, things were getting a little stale. The group had expanded in a big way, and this led to the overall impact of the New World Order getting watered down. The NWO Wolfpack did freshen things up a little and fans were receptive to the red and black version of the NWO, but the New World Order in general felt like a tired idea that WCW was running into the ground. On the flip side of this, 1998 was a pivotal year for the World Wrestling Federation. WrestleMania 14 had ushered in the Stone Cold era, with Steve Austin becoming the WWF Champion, and Vince McMahon had decided to update his wrestling organisation to a much more contemporary product. The WWF were full of fresh ideas while WCW were seemingly stuck with the NWO in their main event picture. There was an exception though, there was one man who was making a lot of noise in WCW, he had no affiliation with the NWO, he wasn't an old WWF guy, and he was booked in such a unique manner that fans had no option but to pay attention. That man was Bill Goldberg. Goldberg seemingly done the impossible in 1998 WCW. He was able to break into the main event scene while guys like Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan were at the top of the mountain. On the July 6th, 1998 episode of WCW Nitro in front of a record audience inside the Georgia Dome, the undefeated Bill Goldberg became the WCW World Heavyweight Champion after defeating Hollywood Hulk Hogan. This ended up being the single most profitable episode of WCW Nitro ever, and it's a real moment in WCW history that you just have to see for yourself. Words can't do it justice. Something I'd like you to keep in mind throughout the entirety of this video though is that Hulk Hogan signed a new contract with WCW shortly before this episode of Nitro, so the creative control clause was also kept intact. This is important and we'll circle back to this later. With the world title now on Goldberg, Hulk Hogan would shift his focus onto other competitors such as the Ultimate Warrior, and the Hulkster would eventually tease a retirement from wrestling while running for president. Starcade 1998 was headlined by WCW Champion Bill Goldberg versus Wolfpack leader Kevin Nash. After a little assistance from Disco Inferno, Bam Bam Bigelow, and Scott Hall and his trusty taser, Kevin Nash done the unthinkable, he ended Goldberg's winning streak. Many fans today question this decision and again we'll talk about this in the second half of the video, but it's insane how many people bash this outcome without watching the footage. The audience inside the MCI Centre 
weather in Washington DC go absolutely crazy when Nash wins the belt. Granted, fans are probably cheering due to the shock of seeing Goldberg take his very first WCW loss, and empty pops like this evidently don't mean a lot in the long run, but for all the complaints directed at Kevin Nash due to the Starcade 98 finish, no one can say that the crowd weren't extremely excited when Goldberg got beat. So to keep the timeline of events fresh, NWO Black and White leader Hulk Hogan was the WCW champion going into the Georgia Dome on the 6th of July 1998. He was defeated by the unbeatable Goldberg on a live episode of Nitro and Goldberg became the champion. And then on the 27th of December 1998, NWO Wolfpack leader Kevin Nash beat Goldberg, ending Goldberg's run as WCW champion and also ending Goldberg's long winning streak. Nitro was in Baltimore the next night and Kevin Nash was annoyed that his win at Starcade had an asterisk beside it thanks to Disco Inferno and Scott Hall getting involved. Big Sexy came to the ring and he announced that Goldberg will get his rematch the following week on Nitro which, ironically enough, would be inside the Georgia Dome, the same venue where Goldberg won the title from Hulk Hogan back in July. So we arrive at the 4th of January, the very first Nitro of 1999. During the first half of of the show, Bill Goldberg got arrested. We didn't know what the charges were, but it looked like the Nash vs Goldberg match was in jeopardy. Kevin Nash was visibly upset about this turn of events, while Hulk Hogan, who was scheduled to make an appearance on Nitro, seemed pleased with what happened. Hogan said that if Goldberg was a criminal, then he deserved to go to jail. Remember, Hogan was doing his phony presidential campaign during this time period. As it turned out, Miss Elizabeth was accusing Goldberg of stalking her. Kevin Nash came out to the arena saying that if Miss Elizabeth is behind Goldberg going to jail then Hulk Hogan is obviously pulling the strings. Nash asks Ric Flair, the WCW president at the time, for a warm up match against Hogan. Nash said that Goldberg would get cleared before the end of Nitro and the Nash vs Goldberg rematch will still happen later in the night, but Big Sexy wants a piece of Hulk Hogan in the meantime. Ric Flair agrees, so the fans in attendance are kind of excited expecting two Kevin Nash matches on Nitro this evening and the WCW title would be on the line in both matches. Hulk Hogan comes out for an interview and he agrees to the match also, saying that he's going to beat Kevin Nash while retiring from wrestling as the world champion. After the promo, Tony Schiavone told fans what was going to happen over on Raw in the main event. Tony told WCW viewers that Mick Foley was going to win the WWF title and he sarcastically said that that should put a lot of butts in seats. We'll come back to this a little later too. Miss Elizabeth admits that she made the accusations up and Bill Goldberg arranges a drive back to the Georgia Dome. Meanwhile, it's time for Hogan vs Nash. Hogan comes out with NWO Hollywood member Scotty Steiner and something I just want to point out here, it's been reported time and time again that fans didn't want to see Hogan vs Nash here tonight, but look at the audience, they're dancing. Fans are actually dancing in the arena before the scheduled match. You notice things like this quite a lot when you take the time to go back and do your research instead of reading reports or reading books or even watching WWE produced documentaries. Kevin Nash comes out to a great ovation but the audience goes nuts when Scott Hall follows. Scott Hall walks out wearing the NWO Wolfpack colours. Hogan and Nash are now in the squared circle and the two men circle around the ring for a little to waste some TV time. Nash mocks Hogan by ripping off his shirt in classic Hulkamania style. The audience is at a fever pitch and let's cut to the chase. Yes. finger poke of doom. It was all an elaborate scheme. Hulk Hogan just won the World Heavyweight Championship and it was a big plan all along to reunite the NWO while bringing the belt back to Hollywood Hogan. Goldberg shows up after finally making it to the arena. Keep in mind that Tony Schiavone said earlier in the broadcast that the police station was just across the road by the way and Bill Goldberg storms the ring to take out the NWO. Things were going well until Hogan hit Goldberg with the title belt. 
but Goldberg was able to spear the Hulkster. Lex Luger then showed up and we thought Luger was going to help Goldberg, but instead the total package assists Hogan. Goldberg takes a beating in the ring, the planned Nash vs Goldberg match has obviously been axed, and the show goes off the air with Kevin Nash saying to the camera, can you say deja vu? The NWO had reformed and this would be the birth of the NWO Elite. Okay, that's the first part out of the way. You now know what happened on TV. Now it's time to look at some behind the scenes aspects and look at how the finger poke of doom truly affected WCW. Let's first tackle one of the biggest questions. Why did Kevin Nash beat Goldberg and who made the decision to end Goldberg's streak? The common story we hear is that Kevin Nash had taken over his head booker in WCW before Starcade and he booked himself to end the streak and win the title. From what I've gathered, Kevin Nash was indeed on the booking committee in some capacity and he did have the ability to throw out ideas, but the final decision still came down to Eric Bischoff. Kevin Nash, along with Diamond Dallas Page, had had become what was described as idea men. They had sit in creative meetings and give input, but they didn't have any kind of final say. It all came down to Eric Bischoff in the end, but Eric admits that his creative team during this time period were a bunch of yes men. Eric said, I don't know whose idea it was and it's impossible for me to tell you. Other than a few creative beats that I know for a fact were mine, 98% of the things you saw on TV were a collaboration from a bunch of different people, so it's really hard to pinpoint who raised their hand and said Kevin Nash should beat Goldberg. It might have been Kevin, but it was probably someone else. Kevin was hesitant. He had seen what happened when Ric Flair was the booker and when Flair was booking for himself. It made sense then because he was Flair, but Ric also got a lot of hate for it. It's a bad position to be in. I doubt it was Kevin's idea, but when I heard it, I went with it. How do you keep the streak alive when there's nobody left? So Eric basically says that Nash could have came up with the idea, but he doubts it. Eric also confirms that he okayed the angle, and Eric did indeed have the final say, so that's done. Kevin Sullivan, who was also on the committee at the time, said, Eric and Kevin were doing a lot of the booking. It might have been Eric's call, it might have been Kevin's call, it might have been somebody else's call, but when they gave me the finish, I said, please don't do it this way. Sullivan pretty much washes his hands of the whole thing, yet he still doesn't say whose idea it was. Kevin Nash himself said, People wanted to see Goldberg get beat, but when he got beat, they went, Oh, I'm not sure I wanted to see that. That's only because of the 15 run-ins, the cattle prods. If we went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and if I had beaten Goldberg with the powerbomb, I would have been a god. The whole thing was designed to put together a faction to oppose Goldberg. It was the old school Hulk Hogan philosophy, build a team of heels that Goldberg could fight for 8 months, that's the way it was laid out. Anybody that knows Kevin Nash knows that I'm a pretty smart guy. If I'm going to beat Bill Goldberg after 172 wins in a row, I'm sure as f not going to turn around the next Monday, do a finger poke of doom and hand the belt to Hulk Hogan. What did that do for Kevin Nash? What did Goldberg's streak do for Kevin Nash? Now, if I'm going to book myself, I'm going to go on a 173 win streak and dodge Goldberg as a heel. And so Kevin Nash also says that the booking decisions around Starcade also didn't come from Big Sexy himself. Nash makes a great point too, when you really think about it, Nash came out of the whole ordeal looking like a chump. Yes, he did end the streak, but to hand his achievement for doing so to Hulk Hogan really didn't do Kevin any favours in terms of perception. The key phrase that Kevin Nash said though was Hulk Hogan philosophy. When we look at Hogan's history with the WCW Championship, the Finger Poke of Doom has Hogan's fingerprints all over it, excuse the pun. Kevin Nash pretty much confirmed this during an internet Q&A days later when he said, Until Hulk Hogan completely retires from professional wrestling, he's the man. He can make your life in this business very easy if you're on his team. His money and his power can make your life a whole lot easier. You can either jump aboard his express, earn a ton of money and live an easy life, or try to fight him like I did for almost a year and not get used. 
you're not going to beat him politically, you're just not going to be able to function in a company when he's on top unless you're on his team. It's a business decision and it's the right decision. Honestly, my theory here is that Hogan wanted to win the belt back in the Georgia Dome after dropping it six months prior in the same venue. The creative team, including Kevin Nash, had come up with this idea to appease Hulk Hogan. Remember, creative control. So a bad decision was made to have Kevin Nash win the title and then Nash lays down the week later for Hulk Hogan. You may wonder why Hulk just didn't beat Goldberg at Starcade, and it's a good question, but keep in mind that Hogan was only contracted for a certain amount of matches per year and Starcade was right at the end of 1998. This could also explain why the finger poke of doom didn't happen the night after Starcade. Hogan's last match before the finger poke of doom was the atrocious Halloween Havoc showdown with the Ultimate Warrior and that was months prior. Plus Goldberg had already beat Hogan. Kevin Nash vs Goldberg at Starcade was legitimately the first time the two men stepped into the ring in a one on one match. And then there's the NBC WCW special that no one mentions. WCW were negotiating with NBC to air a special event in a prime time television slot on Valentine's Day along with more specials down the road. After their success with WWF Saturday Night's main event, NBC reportedly wanted Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage in the main event for the first special. This explains why Randy Savage returned the week prior and then didn't show up again until April. And this explains why Hogan came out of his quote retirement earlier than scheduled. If NBC wanted Hogan and Savage then it's very possible that Hogan and indeed WCW wanted the Hulkster to main event the show with the WCW belt. The specials though never took place. The first special was to fill a hole in NBC's broadcast schedule when the NBA All-Star game was cancelled due to the 98-99 season lockout. But in the end Harvey Schiller told Eric Bischoff the Turner higher-ups were not very keen on NBC making profits from a Turner Broadcasting franchise and when the NBA eventually returned to NBC after the lockout, the deal completely fell apart and WCW did not appear on the network. If all of this was the reason for Hogan getting the belt, then you have to appreciate the irony and the finger poke of doom happening on TV when, in the end, it was absolutely unnecessary. Hogan possibly won the belt in preparation for an event that didn't even happen. As bad as the finger poke of doom was, WCW airing on NBC could have led to a significant boost in viewership. Still, this all doesn't change the fact that the finger poke of doom was a poor booking decision. It's just a shame that we can't pinpoint who definitively came up with the Nash vs Goldberg finish and we can't pinpoint who came up with the finger poke of doom angle. No matter what stories I've read online or the books that I've read, if neither Bischoff saw Sullivan or Nash can confirm whose idea it was, then to me we will never know who came up with one of the most infamous moments in WCW history. There's been a lot said about how fans switched over to Raw when Tony Schiavone announced on Nitro that Mick Foley was going to win the WWF title. Around 600,000 fans, not a million, 600,000, turned over to Raw from Nitro to see the title change. There's no doubt that this was a catastrophic blunder, but as mentioned in Guy Evans' Nitro book, the only book that contains painstaking research into the subject, along with sources within TBS, a total of 2.3 million viewers joined the TBS. TNT broadcast during the Goldberg run-in at the end of the show. This was due to Nitro running a few minutes later than Raw of course, this was an Eric Bischoff tactic that done well to capture extra numbers before and after Raw went on the air. No doubt about it though, announcing that there would be a new WWF champion crowned on the opposing show was a really bad move. It was a free advertisement and a free invite for fans to switch over and see something special. No matter how many viewers WCW got at the end of the Nitro broadcast it was still a big mistake to announce what would happen on Raw. And remember too that fans who actually decided to stay with Nitro were treated to the Nash vs Hogan match. If there was ever a case of getting caught with your trousers down then this was it. 
There's a giant misconception though that this whole episode of Nitro drove fans away and there was no recovery afterwards, like this was the only reason WCW went down the toilet, but this is a very, very big generalisation that's been put forward to make the downfall of WCW seem more glamorous, to try and blame the decline on a single in-ring moment on Nitro, and it's absurd to do so. Consider this, the January 4th 1999 episode of Nitro was behind Raw with a 5.0 to the WWF's 5.7, but the ratings in the weeks that followed actually showed that there was still some interest in an NWO reformation. WCW Thunder was able to achieve record ratings immediately following the incident, drawing in ratings around the 2.5 area for the first time ever in January and February, and Nitro maintained the same viewership it had done immediately before and after the Finger Poke of Doom, even recording another two 5.0 ratings in the month of January. Sure, the WWF were now beginning to destroy Nitro, but it wasn't until late April that the steady and consistent WCW decline truly began. By that time, Hogan had already dropped the title. So the evidence clearly shows that the finger poke of doom was not the sole reason for WCW's decline. It's clear that it was a mixture of the WWF becoming a better product, WCW and Eric Bischoff being forced to change Nitro's content due to pressure from Turner executives, rendering the company unable to compete with the WWF's edgier product. And also, it was due to WCW going to the well once too often. The NWO storyline had run its course by early 99 and people wanted to see something new and exciting, content that the WWF was offering at the time. WWF Raw was simply a better show than WCW Nitro. WCW fans were tired of getting burned too, with weak finishes and scheduled matches is not even happening, a fine example being the Night of the Finger Poke of Doom. A lot of fans paid to see Nash vs Goldberg as advertised, and they didn't get that in the end. With that being said though, the same amount of fans would continue to tune into Nitro for weeks after the Finger Poke of Doom. It had no immediate effect, contrary to what everyone seems to publish on websites. So, was the finger poke of doom a bad mistake? It sure is notorious for being so, and yes, we can all sit and say how we would have done things differently with perfect 2020 hindsight. You're dealing with wrestling politics here, you're dealing with Hulk Hogan politics brother, and as Nash explains, life seemed a lot more comfortable if you played along, screw the fans and screw the history of the world title. While we have learned that the impact of the incident has been exaggerated over the years, it's still a rotten move. Fans pay money to see wrestling matches and while getting heat is perfectly fine, there's that wrong type of heat and the finger poke of doom had bucket loads of the wrong type of heat. It's the same old same old, it's Hulk Hogan with the world title, it's a bunch of bad guys who pose such a threat that no babyface really had the chance of getting over. It was WCW at its worst during the Eric Bischoff years. Bischoff accepts full responsibility for the whole ordeal, he doesn't push the blame on Hogan or Nash. To his credit, Eric Bischoff holds up his hands and he admits it was a mistake. I'll leave you with this quote then from Eric Bischoff. Were there mistakes? Yeah, it didn't work, but guess what? There's 52 weeks of television every year, hundreds of hours a year, some things work, some things don't. Nobody is 100% all of the time. Were there creative mistakes? Sure, I'll take responsibility for that. If I could have done it differently knowing then what I know now, would I have done it differently? Of course I would. But was Starcade and the Finger Poke of Doom turning points? Absolutely not. That's just asinine. That's people who know nothing about the business trying to sound like they do by pointing out things they know nothing about and trying to make themselves sound really, really smart. It's similar to me sitting back on the Monday after the Super Bowl and talking about how I would have coached the game and the players I would have called differently so we could have won the game. It's no different. There were several turning points, it was not one, and they clearly weren't creative turning points. That's just wrestling dirt sheet nonsense. The real turning point was in mid-1998 when I was told, you're no longer going to use the formula that got you to the dance, you're no longer going to use the formula that almost put Vince McMahon out of business. I knew we were going to lose a bunch of our audience, and we did. I protested it as loud as I could, but that was the turning point.